I am older than time itself. Yesterday, I felt fear for the first time in millennia. I'm not sure why I'm writing this. To be completely honest, I don't expect a single one of you to believe me. I think that maybe I just need to get this off my chest. I can't speak to anyone close to me regarding the matter. My loved ones have no idea that I bear this burden, and they can never find out. Please, before you ask, I'll save you the trouble and address your question head on. If I really am older than time, how do I have any loved ones left? Shouldn't they all have died out by now? Well, yes and no. My parents passed away nearly 10,000 years ago. Since then, I have started countless families in more countries than I can name. Fortunately for me, I was blessed with the ability shapeshift, so whenever my spouse passes away, I conveniently go missing, only to start anew elsewhere. But why, why do I feel the need to move endlessly from place to place, abandon my old families, and settle down with a new wife and children? Honestly, I do it out of boredom. Life gets pretty lonely sometimes, and I've found that it helps ever so slightly to be surrounded by people who care about you. As for why I leave my old families behind, well, I think that part is fairly obvious. After enough time passed, someone would wonder why Grandpa hadn't kicked the bucket yet. I don't want the attention. I've had enough of that over the years. But ancient, nameless entity, why should we give a shit about your love life? I bet that's what you were thinking, huh? Well, I'm on my umpteenth honeymoon right now. Something went seriously wrong, and my wife is none the wiser. The trouble began yesterday. I was lying beside Carolyn on a beach chair, breathing in the pristine Caribbean air. Blue waves rolled softly in the ocean. Palm trees swayed in the breeze. The sand was just warm enough to sink my feet into. It was perfect, until he appeared, that is. Babe, I'm gonna get another daiquiri. Do you want one? Carolyn asked, rising from her seat. Nah, I'm good. Thanks for asking, though. Are you sure you don't want one? I won't let you steal half my drink if you change your mind. I grinned at her. You know what? Fuck it, get me one too. That's what I thought. Be back in a sec, she said, winking at me as she trotted toward the tiki bar. I shut my eyes, soaking in the warmth of the sun on my skin. I'd probably visited that exact destination dozens of times throughout the years, but nothing compares, you know? An amazing view with a drink in hand and a beautiful woman by your side. Yeah, nothing beats that. I was too busy basking in the golden rays to notice the man shuffle up to my wife's chair. I suddenly felt a presence looming over me. It radiated a sinister aura, one that I had only felt the likes of a handful of times throughout the span of my life. I hesitantly glanced up, locking eyes with the man hovering above me. Uh, can I help you? I asked, brows furrowed. Yes, you can. Is this seat taken? He replied, motioning to Carolyn's beach chair. Yeah, my wife's sitting there. Well, I'm sure she won't mind if I borrow it for a moment, he grinned. His smile was perfect, almost unsettlingly so. His teeth were stark white, his eyes a seafoam green, and his chiseled jawline looked sharp enough to cut glass. It was as if he was created in a laboratory. Look, man, I don't know what you want from me, but my wife's gonna be back any second now, and if... The mysterious stranger snapped his fingers, that devilish smirk growing even wider, that shouldn't be an issue. A chill rippled down my spine for the first time in eons. I apprehensively glanced at my surroundings, my eyes growing wide as I struggled to comprehend what I was seeing. Everything was still. The trees had stopped swaying. The waves were no longer rolling in. Seagulls were frozen in the sky, mid-flap. My head began to spin, and I felt as if I was going to spew strawberry daiquiri all over the smooth white sand. I shakily turned back to the man, mustering up the courage to ask a question that I already knew the answer to. Who are you? Ah, yes. It's been a while since I've been asked that, he said, reclining back and taking a sip from my nearly empty drink. I am a being long forgotten by man, one whose name faded from the mouths of humans long ago, but I have a feeling that you remember it well. Tell me, O oh, ancient one, what do you think my name is? He leaned forward almost giddy with excitement. Carabas, I shuddered. He was right. That name hadn't been uttered for longer than I could remember, and I had hoped it would stay that way. Saying it out loud gave me chills. 
Ding, ding, ding! We have a winner, he shouted, spreading his arms out dramatically. What do you want with me? You're not supposed to be here. Oh, come now. We haven't met in close to ten millennia, and this is how you greet me. You really should be more polite. I did save your life, after all. I gulped, sweat beating atop my brow. You did, and I'm grateful for that. I really am, but it's not my time yet. We made a deal, and you have to keep your end of the bargain. Carabus exhaled, shaking his head. He chuckled to himself before returning his gaze to me. You humans really are naive, you know. I'm assuming that you can recall the details of our agreement, yes? Yeah, pretty vividly too. You granted me the gift of immortality, and upon my death, my soul would belong to you. But in case you haven't noticed, I ain't dead yet. Carabus's eyes glowed. It was as if we were playing chess, and he was one move away from checkmate. Those are the basic terms, yes. I must say, I certainly did not expect you to last this long. You've nearly succumbed to an array of injuries and illnesses, yet you always pull through. Like during the Babylonian War, when you were gravely injured by a swordsman, or when you came down with the bubonic plague in the 14th century. And who can forget that delightfully close call during Calcutta Cyclone of 1737? You've left me salivating. Each brush with death is exhilarating for me. I'm just itching to get my hands on you, he cooed, gracefully striding up to me. He traced the outline of my jaw with a playful finger. Your wife really is a lucky woman, keeping you all to herself like she does. I batted his hand away. Get to the point. I know you didn't come here just to flirt with me. Oh, you're no fun. Fine. Carabas leaned in close and whispered into my ear. His words chilled me to my very core. For the first time in thousands of years, my heart thundered against my chest, and I felt the color drain from my face. No, you're lying. I didn't agree to that. Ah, but you did, my dear boy, he said, smiling wider than the Cheshire cat. I don't believe you. Prove it. Carabas sighed, pursing his lips. Your wish is my command. He suddenly grasped my shoulder. An icy chill rippled down my arm and my vision began to fade. Before I knew it, I was watching a scene unfold before me, like a spectator at the movie theater. My stomach twisted itself into knots. I knew what was going to play out, and it made me nauseous to think about. I recognized the man who lay before me. He was a primitive version of myself. His hair and beard were dirty and overgrown, and he was cloaked in a reindeer pelt smattered with flecks of crimson. But the most notable feature? An arrowhead punctured his neck, dark viscous liquid oozing from his gasping mouth. And then something else began to materialize. A dark black cloud of smoke emerged, beginning to form the rough shape of a human. I know that you don't have much time left, so I'll make this quick, it said in a now dead language. I will spare your life and grant you the gift of immortality. What I want in return is your soul, should you meet an untimely demise. Are you interested in my offer? The light was quickly fading from my eyes. I nodded weakly in response. Fantastic! All I need is a thumbprint that will act as a signature on this dotted line, and you will be right as rain, my friend. Carabus beamed, producing the contract from thin air. The montage paused for a moment, and Carabus's voice boomed from the surrounding darkness. Pay particular attention to what you are about to sign. I scanned the parchment, blood pounding in my ears. He was right. There it was, clear as day, in the fine print. I could only watch in horror as my past self pressed his bloody thumb above the dotted line. I suddenly found myself back in the present. Carabus's eyes lit up. He was dangling the same document that I had signed all those years ago in front of my face. I swiped at it, futilely trying to snatch the wretched thing from his grasp. Ah, no touching, he purred, retracting the parchment. Now that you have your proof, I really must be going. This is your 24-hour notice. Enjoy your vacation while you still can. Oh, and tell Carolyn I said hello, he smirked, turning to leave. Wait, you tricked me. I couldn't read back then. Writing hadn't even been invented yet, for fuck's sake. How was I supposed to know what I was agreeing to? Carabas shrugged nonchalantly. I never claimed that the deal didn't have stipulations. With that, he shot me one last knowing smile and snapped his fingers, leaving me all alone once again. 
Carolyn trotted up to me moments later, drinks in hand. I couldn't bear to tell her. I still haven't. I have made a terrible mistake. In the print beneath the main terms of the agreement was something that I hadn't noticed before. A condition that read as follows. If the signee still has not perished 10,000 years from his original date of birth, he shall thereby forfeit his soul to Caribus. I'm freaking out. I don't know what to do. Because the clock is ticking, and in a few short hours, I will officially turn 10,000 years old. 